from 1995 to 2002. NFL fans saw four new franchises to make 32 teams in the league. Those four new franchises were the Carolina Panthers, the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Cleveland Browns, and the Houston Texans. Out of those four expansion teams, it took the Houston Texans the longest to make their first playoff appearance. In this video, I want to take a look at Houston getting an NFL team back and to do a small comparison with the other expansion teams and then give my opinion on why David Carr, who was expected to be the franchise quarterback but struggled and wasn't able to get Houston to the postseason, as it's much deeper than just saying it was the offensive line. So to begin, when the NFL expanded to include the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Seattle Seahawks, it was an extremely rough beginning, especially for the Bucs early on. Hence, when Carolina and Jacksonville came into the league in 1995, the NFL, they didn't want to experience the difficulties that Tampa Bay and Seattle went through. As a result, Carolina and Jacksonville, they were given extra draft picks and didn't have any salary cap restrictions as free agency was still fairly new. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but Carolina, they had some free agent hits, which really helped them get to a 12-4 record in only their second year of existence, and that included a conference championship game appearance. Meanwhile, Jacksonville, they found their quarterback in Mark Brunel, and they acquired him with a trade, and they did a good job building an explosive offense with good young talent on defense, which helped Jacksonville also make their conference championship game appearance in just their second year, as they were a Super Bowl contender from 1996 to 1999. But... Due to the quick success of those two franchises, in 1999, the Cleveland Browns, they didn't get the same benefits. Now, from my point of view, the Browns, they seem to try to get players with potential in the expansion draft, as their expansion draft, to simply put it, was far from successful. Now, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I just want to show how the 95 expansion teams, they had it much easier to be competitive earlier than Cleveland and Houston. But some real quick points to make, and this is from the book False Start, How the New Browns Were Set Up to Fail by Terry Pluto. What hurt Cleveland was that ownership was installed late, not a lot of time to get ready for the expansion draft, and no scouting staff was formed, and more restrictions as to who Cleveland could select in the expansion draft. But Cleveland, they made it to the postseason in their fourth year, as I would say it was due to a couple of solid free agent signings on defense, and I thought Butch Davis was a really good coach. I'm sure many Browns fans would disagree, but after the Butch Davis days, it would be very rough for Browns fans. But now it's time to talk about the Texans. So... The NFL, they had 31 teams with Cleveland coming into the NFL in 1999. This meant that an NFL team would have a bye week every week. I remember in 2001, the Cardinals in first place after week one with a 0-0 record. But anyways, a 32nd team was needed. And I was honestly stunned that it was Houston and not Los Angeles getting an NFL franchise. As LA still at this time did not have an NFL franchise at this point. According to Stacker.com, the Apollos, the Bobcats, Stallions, Texans, and Wildcatters, they're among the finalists for the team name, and obviously the Texans won. So Bob McNair, he was the owner, and Charlie Casterly, he was the GM. More on Casterly later on, and Dom Capers, he'd be the head coach. Capers was previously the head coach of the expansion Carolina Panthers. And then I need to mention that Chris Palmer, he'd be the offensive coordinator, and he coached for two seasons with the Jacksonville Jaguars staff and he'd be the head coach for the Cleveland Browns for only two seasons when their expansion team and came in the league in 1999. With everything in place, it would now be time to get to work to try to get the Texans to be more like the Jaguars and Panthers and not the Browns. So Charlie Casterly, the Houston Texans, first GM, and I like hearing his analysis on TV, but as a GM, he was the assistant GM when Washington had all that success in the 80s and be the GM from 1989 to 1999 with Washington. And I don't want to get much into his past, but perhaps his most notable pick was drafting quarterback Heath Schuler, third overall in 1994, as that didn't quite work out. But to his credit, Casterly, he did draft a solid QB in Gus Farratt in the seventh round in that same draft. So first, for the expansion draft, Houston, they selected some notable names that could help. And I do want to mention... I thought there were better players available for Houston in comparison to Cleveland, but some of the names that Houston drafted that were good players and kind of in their prime were cornerback Aaron Glenn, defensive tackle Gary Walker, linebacker Jamie Sharper, wide receiver Jermaine Lewis, and cornerback Marcus Coleman. Now the biggest name was offensive tackle Tony Baselli. however the future Hall of Famer would never play for the Texans due to shoulder injury. So some solid names were drafted in the expansion draft, but who is going to play quarterback? With the first pick of the 2002 NFL Draft, the Texans, with their first ever draft pick, selected quarterback David Carr. And I was a huge David Carr fan and thought he was going to be really good. In short, I loved his accuracy, touch, could make all the throws in the pocket, and just love how that ball came out of his hand with his three-quarter delivery. Joey Harrington was a QB who was getting more publicity, 
And was the QB the national media really liked? But for me, I was all about David Carr, and I thought he was clearly the better QB. So real quick, just to recap Carr's final season at Fresno State, the Bulldogs had a tremendous start to their season with what seemed to be three impressive non-conference wins. Fresno State was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. They cracked the top 10 and even got a first place vote. So I was all about the Bulldogs, wanted to see a non-BCS team get that chance to play for the national championship, but Carr and Fresno State, they lost to Boise State and Hawaii, and then they were invited to play in the Silicon Valley Football Classic versus Michigan State. And for this game, I'll talk about this later on because there were some signs from this bowl game in regards to some negative aspects of David Carr's game that I failed to acknowledge at the time. So the Texans, they drafted David Carr. Backing up David Carr, I just want to mention, would be Tony Banks, who really made some beautiful passes and threw a nice deep ball. But he had issues with fumbling, and his play wasn't really consistent enough. But anyways, I remember seeing something that Tony Banks, who understood that Carr was the future, thought he should have started in Houston's first season while Carr could learn and come in when he's ready to play, which perhaps could have been the better decision. But nonetheless, Carr, he'd be the starter for the Houston Texans in the first game ever, Sunday night on ESPN, home against the Dallas Cowboys. The Texans had scored quickly, went up 7-0, and wound up winning 19-10 as Dallas, they did not play well. But it was a great day for the Houston Texans fans. And that day, David Carr, he made some nice throws. But for the rest of the season, the Texans, they finish at 4-12. Understandable for an expansion franchise. And either their win against Dallas or a strange 24-6 win at Pittsburgh was a highlight of the season. But the big item for the 2002 Houston Texans was that David Carr, he was sacked to record 76 times in a season. Now, there has to be a deeper dive into the context to determine how much was it on the QB, the line, the receivers, the coaching, and so forth. This isn't the definitive answer, but I'm going to give some reasons, in my opinion, as to why David Carr did not succeed in Houston. Now, I heard that one way that they were trying to develop Carr was when Carr was going to drop back, he was told only to throw to his first read. Now, if that receiver was covered, or throw it away, or try to make a play, as Dave Carr, he did have better than average athleticism for quarterbacks back then. This was the same tactic with Rick Meyer to make it simple, according to the episode Top 10 NFL Bus video on the NFL Network. Now, I had to look hard to try to double check and confirm if this was a coaching tactic to use for David Carr's development. Now, I couldn't find anything, but this is just what I remembered. And if you look at some of those dropbacks, it looked like that Carr look at his first read and then just go and not go through his progressions. Now, I have no idea if offensive coordinator Chris Palmer, when he was in Cleveland, if he did this with Tim Couch or if anyone else was taught to do this during a QB's first year, as I really don't know if this is a good way to develop a quarterback. But it makes you question if the quarterback can handle a lot of information if they're doing that. Just teaching you to look at your first read and then go or just throw it away. Now, before I get to the biggest issue I saw with Carr, I just want to mention that Carr would somewhat steadily improve, but not really show he was a franchise quarterback. He was thought to be from 2002 to 2004. But then in 2005, the Texans, they went 2-14. Then head coach Dom Capers, he was fired. And in would be Gary Kubiak. Enter Gary Kubiak. He learned under Mike Shanahan, was going to do the zone blocking scheme and wanted to set up play action. At first, Kubiak, he signed off to bring Carr back and extend Carr's deal for three more seasons, but it wound up not working. In an article from Michael Smith of ESPN from August 4, 2006, Smith wrote that Carr was just a bit too cozy with the former regime, the Don Capers regime, and Carr admitted he was probably more coddled than coach. David Carr, he was coached differently from the other players and was treated with kid gloves by Capers and former offense coordinator Chris Palmer and others. The article also mentioned that Carr's college coach, Pat Hill, was a lot tougher on him than the people on the coaching staff with Dom Capers. So with Gary Kubiak, an article I want to mention from the San Francisco Gate, which was written by Richard Justice, the article stated that Carr was coached very hard by Kubiak. And then after four or five games of the regular season, Kubiak, he stopped yelling at Carr he apparently knew that Carr wasn't up to the job. So when the season ended, Carr was let go. The Texans, they then traded for an unproven Matt Schaub. And as a result, this is how the David Carr era ended in Houston. Yes, numerous reasons and excuses can be made on why a quarterback did not work. And especially today, it seems like that the excuses are out of control and nothing is on a quarterback. But I just want to make one more point as to why I thought, from my point of view, that David Carr did not become the franchise quarterback for the Texans. I mentioned earlier, I was a huge David Carr fan and thought very highly of him. But his bowl game against Michigan State kind of got to me worried about some things. But at the time, I ignored it. So for that game with Fresno State and Michigan State, 
I was excited to see David Carr play, but Michigan State seemed to be in control throughout that game. Now Carr, he had some great stats, however, there were times where Carr, he was holding onto the ball extremely long and had issues during this game figuring out where to throw the ball and couldn't find anyone open. Now this full game, it's not on YouTube, as this is just what I remembered. We didn't have access to the All-22 film to see what happened, but this game would always pop into my mind when David Carr would struggle with Houston because there were times where I felt Carr was not able to get rid of the ball quickly, couldn't make quick decisions, couldn't go through his progressions, and hold on to the ball too long. There are coaches who have their plan to develop their quarterback, as I would say Andy Reid is the best at developing QBs and getting production from that position. But somehow, you have to tell if a quarterback can process the information, which is the hardest thing to scout. And it seems so extremely challenging to coach a QB to process the information quicker. Nowadays, there is an S2 cognitive test to perhaps give scouts, GMs, and so forth to give them a better idea who can process the information quickly. But as I'm doing this video, Texans quarterback CJ Stroud, he scored horribly on that test with an 18. But you know what? He seems to be pretty damn good thus far. He seems to be able to process the information. So that's the video. Just wanted to talk about the Houston Texans when they came into the NFL and talk about David Carr's career in Houston. What do you think about David Carr's time in Houston? Thank you so much for your interest in this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you are interested, there is a link down below to support with Patreon. Thank you so much.